Okay, and now finally what I want to do is very briefly describe the Joule-Thompson coefficient, or excuse me, describe the Joule-Thompson experiment. Um, we do the Joule-Thompson experiment in Chem 363 lab. This is definitely um, what can be a favorite of people. Um, if you like working with high pressure gases and programming, um, we, we program the temperature um, measurement on a computer. So you have to have a very sensitive temperature measure to do this. Okay, but I want to describe how Joule and Thompson were able to work this out, how to give this experiment isenthalpic conditions. And they figured this out by doing a flow of gases. So in that original Joule experiment, it was static. So there was one static chamber and another static chamber, opened it up, all the expansion happens, and then it's done. In the Joule Thompson experiment, there's a constant flow from a high pressure side to a low pressure side. So imagine I've got a tube here, okay? And that's what's pictured down there, right? And I'll describe how the picture of the tube differs from the picture that I'm drawing, okay? So and I'll say high P and low P, and you have this tiny little open nozzle that we call a throttle. The throttle is the key in the Joule-Thompson experiment. So you have some set of initial conditions over here, and it's drawn like, it, like a piston, and you can approximate this as a piston to prove that it's isenthalpic, and I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time with that. Um, all I wanna take note is we have some initial condition Okay, where PI is always going to be greater than PF in this situation. And that's because typically PF is open. So this, this other side of the throttle is open to the atmosphere. And because you have this throttle, it limits the flow of gases. So it allows pressure to build on the other side of that throttle. So we call differential pressure, where it's technically open. This is technically an open system from one side to the other. Mass and heat can be exchanged from the initial chamber to the final chamber. However, because this throttle is tiny, it makes like a stop gap or like a plug, if you will. Okay, so it has a throttling effect. Okay, and so the result of that, and I'm not gonna go through this math proving this is isenthalpic, follow it along in the book or my notes, okay? So, but what's the result? What's the result of having this throttle? Well, I'm gonna demonstrate that for you right now, okay? So, I'm a big gas bag full of hot air. That's the truth. There it is, right? I can feel all of these warm gases because my body is warm, and I'm expanding those gases out into the atmosphere. And I can feel the warmth on my hand. What happens now if I make a throttle? right? Same temperature. My body hasn't changed temperature. Now what does it feel like? It feels cold. Do this. Try this. It feels cooler. I am actually throttling the gases as they expand out of my lungs and it is cooling them down vis-a-vis -vis the Joule-Thompson effect, which is really, really cool. Okay, so what does all of that mean and what's going on with this? Okay, well, we said Joule Thompson mu is partial of T, partial of P at constant H, which is the same thing as saying delta T over delta P, or which is saying T final minus T initial over P final minus P initial. Okay. And so as it turns out, not all gases cool when they expand, but the vast majority of gases do, okay? And so because the vast majority of gases do cool as they expand, what's the explanation? Well, the explanation is they're intermolecular forces. They're non-ideal behavior. As you are trying to separate them, okay, they are attracted to each other. And because they're attracted to each other, it takes energy to 
pull them apart. Well, because this is done in an adiabatic container, there's no available energy other than the molecules kinetic energy themselves. So when you force them to expand over this throttle, so when you create this constant flowing experiment where the initial pressure is greater than the final pressure, where the whole thing is adiabatic and isenthalpic, you will see molecules cooling themselves down to expand. And that is a result of non-ideal behavior. Here it is. Just creating that throttle gives you that behavior. It's really, really cool. Okay. Okay, so what does all this mean? Well, what happens when mu is greater than zero? What does that mean? And what happens when mu is less than zero? What does that mean? Okay. Well, think about this. Because in this experiment, pi is always greater than pf, okay, the delta p is always negative in this experiment, right? So that means when mu is greater than zero, you have a negative delta t, and so thereby there's a cooling effect. And when you have a mu less than zero, you have to have a positive delta t, thereby it's a warming effect. So when would a gas cool upon expansion as a result of Joule-Thompson? And when would a gas warm? Well, a gas would cool if attractive intermolecular forces were dominant, right? Because if attractive intermolecular forces are dominant, they're like they want to be next to each other. So they have to use their own energy to expand. And because it's adiabatic, they expend their kinetic energy, which allows them to cool down. So, but if a gas warms upon expansion, repulsive intermolecular forces are dominant. Okay. And so it, as it turns out, the boil temp is an okay predictor of this, the inversion temperature is better. And I'm not going to draw up the formula for the inversion temperature. I will define that it's typically given as Ti. The inversion temperature is the temperature at which a gas switches signs and its Joule-Thompson coefficient. And it is fairly closely related to the boil temperature. Okay. So for example, most gases if not all gases at room temperature cool upon expansion. The only ones are helium and hydrogen. Helium and hydrogen warm upon expansion at room temperature, but just barely. As it turns out, helium and hydrogen are very damned difficult to measure undergoing a Joule-Thompson effect because they're practically ideal over most conditions. However, molecules like carbon dioxide have humongous Joule-Thompson coefficients, okay? So CO2, the mu for CO2 is roughly one Kelvin per bar. So, right, it's delta T over P, so the units are Kelvin per bar. And so what that means is for every bar that a sample of CO2 is expanded, it cools by one Kelvin. So consider now an old-school fire extinguisher that actually has CO2 in it not the dry, uh, the powdery stuff, but an actual old school carbon dioxide fire extinguisher. Those things are shaped like this. Let's see if I got another picture. Okay. So CO2. Oh my God, I can't write. Ah. So a CO2 fire extinguisher, I'm just going to draw a picture of it. And if you've been watching the notes, you know what I'm talking about. So here it is, right? It's this nice little fire extinguisher. It's red. If you've never had the ability to like shoot one of these things off, then you haven't lived yet. And so these things have this big open throttle, right? It's this big conical thing that gives you a throttling effect. So it's very tiny right there and it opens wide up to allow the gas to expand, okay? Well, these things, so PF here is going to be roughly one atmosphere. 
but PI, so like here's the regulator nozzle, right? PI on these tanks can be like several hundred atmospheres. So let's say like 300 atmospheres or even let's, let's make it a little bit more re realistic here. Let's say like 200 atmospheres, okay? So what that tells us is because we know the Joule Thompson coefficient, delta T over delta P for CO2 is about one Kelvin per bar. If you expand this thing by 200 atmospheres, so you just open this thing, you let it throttle right out into the atmosphere, it's going to drop 200 Kelvin. It's going to get really, really damn cold and it'll put out a fire. We'll prove this in the laboratory. We will do this in the lab. And if any of you have ever had the benefit of seeing the physics rocket car, they do this exact thing with an old school bottle of CO2 and it drops the temperature so much that you get ice, right? It freezes out the water in the air. Um, you can see this Joule Thompson everywhere, right? <sighs> That's a Joule Thompson effect. Um, for those of you, if you like to uh, barbecue with a propane, tank, as it turns out, propane has a fairly large Joule Thompson coefficient. And when you open that propane tank, that high pressure propane tank, and it expands out into the burner, the tank gets cold. And the tank gets cold because it's undergoing a Joule Thompson expansion. Okay. So this is very, very cool. Um, I do have an activity right here. Um, I think I've pretty much covered all these things. Um, so um, answer these questions. Um, I pretty much covered them all. And um, I'm going to sign off because right now it's 10.52 a.m. on a Friday and we are going to meet live in eight minutes. But you probably will not watch this video by then and that's okay. Uh, all right, folks. I'll see you all soon.